If you skim through a variety of anime titles, there are a lot of bad dads. Whether it's guys who aren't around for their kids, or those that believe their kids need to kill each other in order to prove survival of the fittest works, or those that bully them into getting into a robot, there's not a lot of fathers who seem to genuinely love their children in anime. If you ask the average weeb who the worst anime dad is, there's probably a good chance that they'll say Shao Tucker from Full Metal Alchemist. That's a pretty solid answer, too. His actions were incredibly hard, fearful of losing his state alchemy license without any major scientific breakthroughs for the year, he ended up experimenting on his own daughter, fusing her with the family dog. Truly an absolute monster. Could you imagine anyone doing something worse than that? Come on honey, are you ready for some horrible tests? Take me too. I knew you wouldn't be able to resist the allure of real science. Twelve seconds later. Ah, <laughs> oh, crap. Hello Doomers and Doomettes, I'm your host Didi, and today we take a dive into the abyss as we talk about one of my favorite antagonists, the Lord of Dawn himself, Bondrood. With Made in Abyss Season 2 coming up next year and the success of the last video on Phosphophyllite, I thought it'd be worth returning to this video format once more to see if it's worth continuing, and who would be a better choice than the certified best father in all of anime, Bondrood. Now before we begin, let's just address a few things. This video will contain spoilers for the first season of Made in Abyss, as well as the film Dawn of the Deep Soul, but we won't have any manga spoilers in this time around. And I do need to give a disclaimer that the nature of these did nothing wrong videos is a bit tongue in cheek, as I'm not going to tell you that these characters did good things, but rather we're going to attempt to get into their mindset to truly understand their perspective as a character. So, you know, don't actually go out and perform morally dubious experiments on people, unless of course you get results. And as always, if this is content you're interested in, be sure to like the video, or even subscribe if you'd like to support this channel, as it's the only way to get the algorithm to get this channel out there. And to any returning subscribers, welcome back! With that said, let's take our dive into the abyss. I can't tell you how happy it makes me to have you working right alongside your amazing father! Thanks, Dad! Hey, I've been working on a new theory involving replacing human blood with tiny coffee beans. That's fascinating, son! I once conducted a similar study, but there were laws against those particular methods! Now, Made in Abyss is an ongoing story with a lot of characters, each with their own arcs and developments, of which Bondrood is only the antagonist for one arc in particular. But for context, to help anyone who hasn't seen the series yet, I'll give a very brief overview of the story and some of the leading characters. But if you have the chance, I highly recommend checking it out. It's well worth it. Written by Akihito Tsukushi, Made in Abyss is a manga that began publication in 2012 and received an anime adaptation in 2017. The story is about a society built around a mysterious hole that that goes deep into the earth, known as the Abyss, which is filled with artifacts of lost civilizations and horrifying dangers. If you delve into the Abyss, you become afflicted with what's known as the Curse of the Abyss, and if you attempt to ascend upwards and out of it, the curse can cause serious physical harm to you, depending on how deep you are and how you're trying to get out of it. And that's not even beginning to mention the monsters that lurk deep within. Brave citizens known as Cave Raiders risk their lives to descend into the Abyss in an attempt to uncover artifacts of civilizations lost to time understand the curse and try to absolve it, or simply unravel the mysteries of this strange phenomena. The story focuses on Rico, a young child who seeks to live her life like her mother, a highly successful cave raider who obtained the high rank amongst delvers of a white whistle. White whistles are mysterious cave raiders who have achieved a legendary status in their society. Stories are told of them and they're celebrated. Children aspire to be them, but no one truly knows a lot about them. When we're personally introduced to a white whistle in the flesh, Ozen the Immovable, she turns out to be a very cold and apathetic person as she prepares the children for their descent into the abyss. Here we are warned of the other white whistles, including Bondrood. Heck, Ozen even tells the children to beware of him, saying that he's not as kind as she is. Upon learning how to get into the deeper layers from Ozen, Rico and her robot companion Reg descend further into the abyss, where they encounter a being called Nanachi, and it's here where we learn some of the true nature of 
Bonjrud. You see, Bonjrud was successful in setting up a safe human base within the fifth layer that allowed passage into the sixth layer. Now, let me stress this element in particular. This was no small accomplishment. This place was called the Sea of Corpses, after all, and is home to horrifying abominations, such as scorpions that are two meters tall with seven tails, bugs that plant eggs and living hosts which will hatch and eat their way out, and other horrifying monsters. As the nature of the abyss gets worse with each layer, the Sea of Corpses at the fifth layer is probably not just a facetious title. Now, the curse of the fifth layer itself results in severe sensory deprivation, making it extremely dangerous to attempt to ascend upwards from. Bonjrud set up his base in order to examine the phenomena of the sixth layer, the capital of the unreturned. When a diver goes down into the sixth layer, it's known as their last dive, as they are never seen from again. The curse of the sixth layer is the total loss of one's humanity, as attempting to ascend too high in this layer will deform the body into a disgusting mass of flesh, and the ones who are killed during this process are arguably the lucky ones. It's through Nanachi's backstory that we find the horror of Bonjrud's experiments. Nanachi is something called a hollow, a survivor of the scientific studies. Bonjrud has been lowering orphaned children into the sixth layer and returning them to the fifth in order to examine the results. He was able to send both Nanachi and their friend Midi into the sixth layer, and in doing so, mitigated the effects of the curse from Nanachi to Midi, forcing her to receive a double dose of the curse while Nanachi did not receive it. The result of this was Midi, being reduced to a terrifying and near indestructible mass of flesh with little semblance of a conscious, and Nanachi being able to retain their personality, as well as being able to see the curse itself, and thus rendering them able to avoid some of its effects. Bonjrud then dubbed this the Blessing. Riko, Nanachi, and Reg then attempt to journey deeper into the fifth layer, but are forced to go through Bonjrud's domain. He welcomes them with open arms and introduces Prushka, his adopted daughter. Reuniting with Nanachi after they ran away from him, he congratulates them and expresses his satisfaction at seeing their development, where Nanachi can only see him as the monster who experimented on children. Nanachi demands that he not harm Riko and Reg, but unfortunately we find that this request is too late. Despite his warm welcomes, he already ordered his underlings, the Umbra Hands, to study Reg through most invasive means. What truly makes Bonjrud absolutely chilling as a character is his utter lack of any ethical boundaries. I mean, this one line in particular completely summarizes his entire character. しかし、<笑> Things go from bad to worse where it's revealed that the accumulation of Bonjrud's studies is that he learned you can remove the organs of children, barely keeping them alive, and put them in cartridges to allow him to mitigate the effects of the curse from himself to the cartridge. And worst of all, we find out that he did the same to Prushka, his own daughter, as the blessing Nanachi received was only capable to take under a circumstance with a true bond of love between the two people, Bonjrud took his daughter and used her in order to obtain his new form. You hear some Something like that, and you gotta think, how can he have any redeeming qualities? Well, here's where I think things get a little bit interesting. While we can all agree that child experimentation probably won't get you any Nobel Peace Prizes, I think it's mesmerizing to take a look at the inner workings of the mind of Bondrude, because it's oddly paradoxical. Bondrude genuinely loves the children, all of them and his love and bond with Prushka as his daughter is completely honest. This isn't just me making up a theory for the video, this comes directly from the author himself in the commentary of the Dawn of the Deep Soul film. It makes sense too, as from Nanachi's experiment, Bonjrud learns that the only way he can receive the so-called blessing is under a circumstance where there is a deep bond of love between the two individuals, and so Bonjrud sought out to create this bond himself. <laughs> He took a suffering child, one who had severe mental and physical trauma, and truly nursed them back to health as her father. The bond had to be genuine, and he made it so. It's incredibly contradicting. The man responsible for torturing children cares for them, and understands them emotionally, and yet still proceeds with his scientific endeavors of questionable ethics. Bondrude isn't evil. 
at least not from his perspective. Granted, everyone is the hero of his own story, but I think it's different for a character such as him. Think for a moment, if you will. What makes someone evil? Is it a desire to cause harm, or is it merely the absence of what is good? If the absence of good creates evil, is a machine evil for not having ethical boundaries? Bondrude is an extreme case of a cold, calculating pursuit of research. At first glance, you may think he's similar to Shao Tucker from Full Metal Alchemist, as both fathers experiment on their own daughters, but here's where I think things differ. Tucker operated out of far more selfishness. He was fearful of losing his license, and that fear drove him into drastic actions out of desperation. Bondrud wasn't desperate. This was deemed the most efficient way to advance research on a phenomena that is not only unknown, but is presenting a greater threat to the outside world every day. To make a simple comparison, it's that mindset which is why he created the Type 4 energy rations. They taste horrible, but why does the taste matter if it's an efficient and healthy meal? Taste is not necessary, nor does it add to the nutritional benefits of it. Essentially, he's going directly to the result without any interest in what would soften the blow of it. When you think about it, that kind of symbolizes his mindset of getting directly to the results with or without any fluff to make things seem better. It may seem silly to make a jump from poor tasting food to child experimentations, but it shows his mindset and how calculating and focused on efficiency that he truly is. His experiments aren't just for his own benefit either. The whole reason people have been turning a blind eye to him is without his research, delving into the abyss would be even more dangerous. Remember, Bondry is a white whistle and therefore highly influential in status. We know he's set up a safe passageway into the sixth layer and maintains a base on the fifth layer. His underlings, the Umbra Hands, individuals that Bondry can take over the body of at any time, all serve him out of their own free will, some even being former bounty hunters that were tasked with hunting him down, yet now choose to serve him, or even potentially become a new body for him. When I say the man has no ethical boundaries, Bondrud will even subjugate himself to his own scientific endeavors, and although he has the safety net of being able to transfer his consciousness to different bodies, that doesn't mean he still doesn't experience the pains of the living. It's just unimportant to him in comparison to his testings, and so he will allow his own body to be brutally destroyed by the curse just to advance his own schemes. And that brings us to something really important, the secret behind the mythical White Whistles. It's revealed to us that the White Whistle artifacts are really something called Life Reverberating Stones, and it's told to us that the necessary ingredient to create this stone is the sacrifice of a human being. It's not just any sacrifice either, it's one where the individual who is forfeiting their life wholeheartedly is devoting themselves to the intended user of it. Through this method, the White Whistle artifact is only ever capable of being used by its original owner, and otherwise if the sacrifice isn't compatible, the ritual and the artifact will not work at all. So who did Bondrude sacrifice? A wife? A child? A friend? No. Instead, Bondrude sacrificed himself, rejecting his humanity in the name of scientific progress. It may seem a bit egotistical to sacrifice yourself in your name, but I think it's a little bit more than that. Bondrude committed himself so hard into his endeavors that he sacrificed his own humanity to do so. In order to have the strength to commit such horrid, inhumane acts in the name of progress, you yourself cannot be human. Reg tells Bondrude to experience the pain of the abyss himself, to experience his own experiments, but this is something he's already done firsthand time and time again, and this highly coordinated assault from Rico, Nanachi, and Reg was little more than just another chance for an observation to him. Ah, I see. You've surprised me. Did you think of this yourself? Remarkable. Marvelous. Once the body he was using was destroyed, he promptly switches to a new form to simply continue on. He then proceeds with his next plan to force the curse onto Prushka, turning her into a cartridge so he may receive the blessing of the Abyss. After a very tense rematch, they finally slay him in his blessed form, causing enough damage to majorly set him back. And what happens when they finally beat this monster, his broken form dying as the gang tries to recover? Child. May your journey overflow with both curses and blessings. He congratulates them. He expresses his appreciation and wishes them the best on their journey. Bondrud absolutely lost his humanity within the abyss. There's no doubt about that. But what replaced it was not malicious intent, but rather the cold, harsh logic of a machine calculating the most efficient way between point A and point B. He doesn't perceive others as human when he himself is no longer one, the same way a computer would calculate with people. And yet, 
Despite this efficient calculation, Bondred is still very perceptive of human emotion. He talks about the importance of what it means to love someone. He cares for a child as if she were his own daughter, and he congratulates Nanachi for overcoming their personal hardships. Hardships that he himself caused, yet without him, Nanachi, Reg, and Rico wouldn't be where they are now. Through his bond created with Prushka, she willingly gave herself up to be the life reverberating stone for Rico. And this wasn't from a desire to get vengeance on Bondrud, but rather a wish to have them simply all be together. And with Prushka becoming the life reverberating stone, for Rico, Rico, Nanachi, and Reg were finally able to enter the sixth layer. If I had to describe it, Bondrud may have lost his humanity, yet at the same time, he understands the importance of human emotion in life. That's why he's so contradicting. He's supportive of others' emotional feelings, yet completely ignores human rights in his experiments. He clashes with the heroes as they oppose him on a moral level, yet he appreciates their endeavors and wishes them the best on their journey downwards. Bondrud is a living paradox. Despite the horrors of his actions, none of it would have been possible without a true bond and genuine love to those he experimented on. Our heroes despise him for the inhumane actions he's committed, and yet in the end, he only wishes to see them succeed on their journey. So that brings us to the core question of this series. Did Bondrud do anything wrong? Well, I think the answer is a little bit more complex than it seems. Despite his crimes, none of his actions are for selfish gains or the pursuit of personal glory, but rather the endeavor to understand the abyss and survive its curse especially with the dreaded 2,000 year mark looming overhead. It becomes an ethical question. Is it worth it to understand the complexities of a force that is threatening humanity at the cost of suffering children? To Bondrud, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. But at the same time, the children he experiments on are more than lab rats to him. He emphasizes their importance and ensures to remember who they are and tells them how special they are, almost like he's recording their sacrifice for the history books. An onlooker would still be horrified to see such experiments, but this kind of behavior is certainly leagues above far worse mad scientist villains who would regard their experimentations as nothing more than mere trash. And that's what makes Bondrude so fascinating. He's an antagonist to the Ark, but he's not a smug egomaniac looking to further his power, nor is he someone desperately trying to seek personal glory, and in a way, that makes him even more terrifying. It removes his humanity, as threats have no meaning to him. Stopping him doesn't mean ruining his experiments, it means providing him with a new perspective on how he can take additional steps going forward. It's why I'd say, taking a step back from the ethical issues, which admittedly is a very big step, Bondred is someone I'd say is only doing what he thinks will provide benefits to the scientific field in studying the abyss in the long run. And considering his new understanding of Rico, Nanachi, and Reg at the end of the third film as he waves goodbye to them as they enter the sixth layer, I think the potential is strong for him to return as an ally to them in later arcs. We've learned that being a white whistle isn't inherently a good thing, and that's not exclusive to Bondrude, and yet, because of his actions, Prushka willingly allows herself to become a life reverberating stone for Rico, allowing her to be a white whistle diver too. And in the end of the third film, I believe the viewer is intended to connect with Bondrud too at the end of the arc, as for the first time, we see a human eye under the helmet. We're finally able to visually associate him with something close to human. For the first time, we no longer see that ominous black mask with a single purple light coming for it. We see a human eye. The emotionless mask is shattered, and after all the ethical violations, we can finally see him as something close to human when he finally lets the children go. So, I think with all that said, I'm gonna add Bondrud as member number two of the Doomer Den certified Did Nothing Wrong squad. For a mad scientist, he really doesn't give into the mad side a whole lot, and is far more accepting of the characters compared to some of the other castmates we've seen in the series before. And compared to other mad scientist villains, he genuinely cares for the cast. And considering how things went, and as we watch him wave off Rico Reg and Nanachi as they go into the sixth layer, I'm pretty confident we'll see him return to them as an ally, with the fruits of his scientific labors paying off in understanding the true nature of this deep, dark abyss. Besides, if you still don't agree with me, the kids who got it real bad in his experiments bullied Nanachi and Midi anyway. They totally had their fates coming to them, right? I'm sorry, but I'm very busy right now. We're testing some highly unstable- <gasps> No! You have the mixture all wrong!
Man, the comments on this one are gonna be fun. If you made it to the end of the video, thank you so much for watching. This video was a lot of fun to put together, and so I definitely like to keep this format going, talking about morally questionable characters as we attempt to view things from their perspective. What do you think of Bonjour the novel? Is he part of your Did Nothing Wrong squad? What scene in Made in Abyss do you not want your parents to walk in on you watching? Let me know in the comments. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up or even subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this. And if you have any suggestions for a future Did Nothing Wrong video, let me know. Next up on the doc, it may be a certain red cyclops from the far future year of 40,000, but we'll see about that, won't we? Thank you so much for watching, and I hope I can see you next time!